Thanks to all of you that submitted your questions for this hashtag Ultimate Warrior Q&A. One of my favorites as a kid. And I am so excited to see him go into the 2014 WWE Hall of Fame. I truly am. I can't tell you. It makes me feel like a kid again. So again, thanks to all of you that submitted your questions for this Q&A. The topic of the next Q&A ties right in again to the 2014 WWE Hall of Fame class. It'll be hashtag Jake the Snake. So here's what you do. You go to Twitter. You follow the show. Add Off the Rope Show is the Twitter handle. And then you tweet your questions using the hashtag Jake the Snake about Jake the Snake Roberts and his career and his accomplishments, his highlights, his lowlights, whatever. You can start tweeting those questions on January 10th, Monday, January 10th. So that way I don't have a week worth of stuff to sort through because the questions will just get lost with all the other interactions from all the other Twitter chatter I do on that um, Twitter account. So let's get started with this one here. First question comes from Jamie Ennis. And then he asked, do you think Daniel Bryan in 2014 is more over than the Ultimate Warrior at the peak of his career? Oh, hell no. Daniel Bryan is over with the live event crowd. He is getting that unanimous babyface reaction, which I think is incredibly important. Something that somebody like a John Cena only wishes that he could achieve. But... We're talking about a warrior who at one point in time, I do argue and believe, was hotter than Hogan. He was Hogan hot. Daniel Bryan in no way, shape, or form is Hogan hot. Let's not get that twisted. At Mr. Nice Hangover 1 asks, how would you book an Ultimate Warrior and Goldberg feud? Kind of similar to what you did with uh, Warrior and Hogan. Maybe have their first interaction be at the Royal Rumble, have it be a fleeting moment, or maybe they would be the last two. And you don't do a whole lot. You know, you try to tease the awesomeness and the uniqueness of it. And you have this monster here and this monster here. Two real irresistible forces going head to head. I think it's one of those instances where it can happen very organically and generate a lot of interest. So you don't need to overthink it. You don't need to overdo it. Sometimes you have to put a lot of effort into it to make something really go. And sometimes you don't. And I don't think you would need a whole lot with Warrior and Goldberg. Especially if you take 98 Goldberg against 1990 Ultimate Warrior. Um, and if I watched the Self-Destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD, yes I have. And not one of my favorite pieces. You know, I'm kind of ashamed that I ever even watched it because it really was a hatchet job and a slander piece on the Ultimate Warrior. I'm not saying that some of the stuff wasn't true, but... Man, you did that DVD about the Ultimate Warrior, and he didn't even have Ultimate Warrior on there to defend himself. And there was very little attempt for anybody to present the other side of the story. It was a very, very one-sided piece. One of the um, DVDs that I think WWE did that they shouldn't have. Um, at Duke THS asks, in your opinion, was the Big Splash a suitable finisher for the Warrior? Yes, I do believe that. And part of the reason is is that you got to remember a lot of times he did the Gorilla Press immediately before that. So it was like a combination finish. Gorilla Press into the Big Splash finish. And, you know, he kept it nice and simple with the Warrior, and that was fine. I think it was a suitable finish for him, a nice, powerful, impactful finish. And what if at WrestleMania 7... Slaughter never turned heel, and it was Hogan Warrior Slaughter for the title. Well, if Ho Slaughter never turned heel, there would have been no reason to involve him in any type of title feud. You would have just done maybe Hogan and Warrior at 7 for the belt and have it been a rematch from WrestleMania 6, which I think there would have been a lot of intrigue and a lot of um, excitement for that. And they'd have been much more likely to get close to the 100,000 seats sold in the L.A. Coliseum, which was supposed to be the original venue, for WrestleMania 7 at the LA Sports Arena. Um, at Callum Burgess, 14, did you like the Ultimate Warrior WCW run? Not particularly, other than when he came in and he was going at Hogan and it was like two colossal egos clashing and you could sense it and you could feel it. That was pretty cool. Other than that, not so much. At Khalil Boy 97, where does Ultimate Warrior rank on your all time list? All time favorites, maybe in the top 10, definitely within the top 15. I think, honestly, sometimes because so many years have passed and the WWE has done such a hatchet job on him and his character and his importance to that company, 
that I've allowed myself at times to maybe be persuaded by that. But as I get a little older and I start to think about it more and more and change the way I view some things, you know, I think back to how much I loved the warrior character and gimmick back in the day and how much of a fan of his I truly was. And, you know, he starts to take his rightful place in my mind. In terms of the all-time list in the WWE, probably top 25, top 35, you know, not one of the all-time greats because his run was too short, but definitely an impact player. Avani Quest, favorite Ultimate Warrior attire color scheme. WrestleMania 7 would be one. Um, otherwise, the color combination that he wore for WrestleMania 6 would be the other one. At Piznik 64, would the Ultimate Warrior get over in today's WWE if he had debuted in the PG era? Hell yes. And I'm going to tell you why. Because with the explosion in interest in comic book movies over the past decade or so, you know, Ultimate Warrior was really like a comic book character come to life. He would fit right into that. And he would be so different and so unique compared to anything else going on in the company at this time that that would be another way for him to get over. And his kind of muscle-bound steroid freak physique that the WWE loves so much would make him a prime candidate for a monster push. And he would have that type of style that a lot of the internet community hates and would force them to boo him. And as a result, he would get himself even more over. So I think it would work, and I think it would work just as well, if not better, than it did in the late 80s. I truly believe that. And I exist in music. Would you have been happy to see a Warrior Surprise return in the Rumble, even if it meant he sadly got eliminated immediately? I would have been very happy for that. Just to see Warrior make that entrance one more time would have been all I needed. After that, just let him come in and run, run in. I would ask that maybe he hits a couple of stiff clotheslines and gorilla presses one person, then eliminate him. I don't care. I got my entrance. I got a chance to see Warrior. I got a chance to be a kid again. That's what I care about. Uh, both at 77 T Dog Knight and Marvelous Mark OTRS ask this question What's your favorite Ultimate Warrior promo? His promo for WrestleMania 6 against Hogan. Tear down the cockpit door, Hulk Hogan. Take the control, Hulk Hogan. Oh, Kogan. <laughs> and then 77 T Dog Knight asked, How awesome would it be to have the rematch of God versus Warrior at WrestleMania 30? That'd be epic, but would even be more epic if they did a behind the scenes thing where both of these egomaniacs and their awesomeness were sitting there discussing how the match would play out and why the, uh, they feel like they should go over on the other person. That would be tremendous. At Ty Mills 1104, what makes just jizz more? Seeing Hogan Hulk up or the Warrior getting fired up? Uh, hulking up versus warring up. Warrioring up, excuse me. Hulking up. It's got to be hulking up. But nothing wrong with warrioring up either. At A7Med underscore LW, do you think Warrior would have won the match at WrestleMania 6 if Hogan was not leaving? Probably. So I think Vince was a smart enough businessman to understand that the Warrior character had a tremendous amount of momentum behind it. Now, maybe he wouldn't have built him up so much if he didn't know he had to get him ready to carry the company for a little while when Hogan was going to leave after WrestleMania 6. Uh, that could be, so maybe they would have never went there. Um, but I'll assume that they would have, and I assume that Vince would have been a smart enough businessman to understand, hey, you know, the great thing about this is not only does it generate a huge monster match in WrestleMania, WrestleMania excuse me, main event, but then we've also got a huge, awesome return match for SummerSlam or Survivor Series or WrestleMania 7. At Cody underscore Doucette, what will they have Warrior do at Mania? I know we'll make an appearance because he's part of the Hall of Fame class. I hope they have him either wrestle. I really do. I want to see him wrestle Ryback and squash Ryback. That's what I want. Just a quick minute and a half match. Fuck Ryback. I hope Warrior goes out there and squashes him. I know I'd enjoy it. But I just want to see Warrior have an excuse to make that entrance one more time. That's all I ask. At Bima to Cashman, do you even load the spaceship with the rocket fuel? One does not simply get in the spaceship without loading the rocket fuel first, Bima. Awesome question. At Kitty's on crack, do you think WWE should have a Legends House starring... 
uh, Warrior and Psycho Sid and Scott Steiner. Oh, fuck yeah. Throw in Hogan and Jake the Snake. Oh, God. Throw Iron Sheik in there. Oh, man. Hey, you, Bubba. I fucking that Hollywood blonde jabroni Hulk Hogan. The only thing worse than him is that gay and the fag ultimate warrior and that no good piece of shit of Brian Blair. Yeah, throw a Brian Blair in there. Oh, fuck yeah. It'd be the greatest reality show ever, in my opinion. At MacDog714, do you compare Warrior to Steiner and Sid on promos? Kind of. That's not necessarily a bad thing, either. Like I said, Steiner was Steiner, Sid was Sid, and Warrior was Warrior. And there's one thing you can say about all three of them on the mic, whether you enjoyed them or whether you didn't. They were unique. And Warrior spoke in tongues, and he said all this shit. Now, when you really sit down and listen to it, it does make sense. It just, he presented himself in a different way, and, you know, it was awesome. Uh, what were your first thoughts uh, when Warrior returned to WCW in 98 to battle Hogan? Um, I was happy to see the Warrior again, but I was just wondering how long it was going to last, frankly. And I was kind of like, at the time, you know, I wasn't as jaded maybe as I am now. I was eager to see him and Hogan feud again, and then, unfortunately, they had the match at Halloween Havoc 98. Um, at Motorhead 94, is there one person that you've always wanted to see Warrior feud with that never happened, and why? Hmm... Goldberg would be one. And I think maybe somebody along the lines of like a Batista or a John Cena. Maybe those would be two others that really stand out to me. At Rare Breed RKO 97. Um, oh, and the reason why those stand out, because like I said, Warrior and Goldberg have very similar um, trajectories in their career paths. I think Batista and Warrior could have a good program, and I think Cena Mears. Warrior more than a lot of people always want to say that was comparing to Hogan. That's the wrong comparison to me He reminds me a lot more of the warrior and I think they could do some good business uh, At Rare Breed RKO 97. Where do you rank Warriors DVD as one of your favorites? And does he get the credit he deserves by his peers? No, he doesn't get the credit he deserves from his peers And I understand that partially that's due to the way he conducted and carried himself and the way he did business but I also know that, frankly, a lot of those that threw those stones at him were jealous of what he got and what he did with it, and they only wish they could be in that spot. As far as where his DVD ranks is one of my all-time favorites, is frankly, like I said before, one of my least favorite WWE DVDs. Because, like I said, it just became a huge prop anti-warrior propaganda slander piece. They should have done better. They could have done more to present the positives of Warrior. They could have done more. It was okay to talk about the negatives, but you got to bring some of the positives. Otherwise, it just feels like a one-sided slander piece. At World of Ch Chelsea, excuse me, finishes out this Q&A. Which three matches or moments would you recommend for someone who hasn't really seen much of the Ultimate Warrior's work? Three moments that would really stand out to me. Hmm... One would be the face-off with him and Hogan at the Rumble in Royal Rumble 90. Two would be the match with him and Hogan at WrestleMania 6. And then three would be the match against Macho Man Randy Savage at WrestleMania 7. Those would be three matches slash moments. Uh, some of his work with Rick Rude, maybe his pose down at the Royal Rumble, that would be something else. That was pretty awesome back in 89. Um, and his feud with Rude for the belt in 90, I thought was really damn good. There's some good work in there. A lot of people sleep on some of the stuff that Warrior did in his time. It was some good shit, man. It really was. So, again, thanks to all of you that submitted your questions for this Ultimate Warrior Q&A. Like I said, next Monday you can start tweeting your questions to add Off The Rope Show on Twitter using the hashtag JakeTheSnake. It's time to talk about somebody else who's finally taking his long, long overdue place in the WWE Hall of, Flame, Hall of Fame, excuse me, in 2014, Jake the Snake Roberts. Awesome.